wanted from you specifically to understand the problem of sort of due diligence in the context of you know, private data and secure computation. It seems like it's a harder problem to solve. Like the due diligence process seems to be just a more difficult process if, if, if there's no access to the underlying data. So I think there's, there's a lot to unpack in, in that question. Um, even prior to some of these rulings coming out, we are a very reputation-focused organization, again, as a pension plan. And so our legal and compliance teams have always been quite risk-averse when it comes to data. And when we look at data sources that might be considered um, particularly private, we, we will pressure test those. So when we are buying data from a vendor that says it's been appropriately aggregated or appropriately anonymized, we will test that and try and see, can you actually re-identify individuals from the data? Because you can't really have blind trust in the technology that's been put in place. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons why we're keen on the, da the data privacy and data security technology, because it does allow you to derive insight from data with less risk, because you're never actually onboarding the data into your own system. So all of the computation actually happens either um, on the other data owner system or in a combined sharded way, in which case you never actually have access to the full data set and, and the risk is minimized. But as you mentioned, Ruben, kind of the diligence is difficult because you never see the data. And there's two challenges to that. One is investors are used to getting their hands on the data and getting, getting dirty, um, and they're no longer able to do that. So they have to be much more hypothesis driven when it comes to the analytics they're doing. A second piece around understanding and trusting the data requires more communication with the data owner um, and some sense of what are the patterns you hope or expect to see um, coming out of that data source. I think this is going to be a, a change management problem and a technique problem as we start to identify kind of how do you actually leverage these data sources effectively when you can't really see what are the null values, what are the gaps in the data, where are the potential issues that you would otherwise uh, view when you're actually doing all of your initial data discovery. Um, so we're still addressing a lot of these challenges in our exploration. Right. Yeah, because it seems to be like in the app any case, I mean, if you had some machine learning algorithm sitting on top of the data and you weren't, it wasn't really clear whether, you know, that algorithm was using the private data or the aggregated data, they could sort of say, well, you know, we don't know. It's, it's the, you know, we, we didn't make a conscious choice to overstep, uh, you know, in terms of the data that that we were using, and some of this private data is private for, I guess, for a reason, right? And so, therefore, yeah, it's sort of tough for me to see how you how you overcome that in a due, in a due diligence process. But um, you're saying you're you're working on it. It's work in progress. It's a work in progress. I think um, we're able to learn a little bit from the other industries that are a bit ahead of us here. So, looking at some of the data networks that are being developed when it comes to uh, healthcare and patient data or banking data and see how they're they're addressing some of these challenges. A big piece of it is the, the, the trust in building a network. So leveraging your relationships to bring other parties into the network uh, to build kind of a trusted conglomerate and not just kind of letting any old person with data in, into the network. So I do think you, you need to have a little bit of um, careful consideration of, of who you allow into the network and who is providing data, because everyone is a little bit at risk if you don't have trust there. Right, okay. All right, so uh, moving, uh, changing gears a little bit, and this is more for the, for the allocators uh, on the panel. So, so how, does that, how does a manager differentiate him or herself when it comes to alternative data? Is it a matter of sort of having a platform to really sort of efficiently and quickly be able to ingest and evaluate new data sources, or is it more about the sort of the thought process that goes into, you know, I want to have an answer, find an answer to a particular question, and I, I'm going to go source the data, transfer that question, and, and that's how you're successful, or maybe, or maybe both. Um, what's your What's your take on that, maybe Brian? Sure. You know, I think um, you know it's often said that that the alpha in a lot of these data sets decays to uh, to near zero, if not zero. As more, um, as more of your competitors ingest it as well. And I think that that's true in a certain sense, but another way to look at it is, you know, everyone gets the same income statements, balance sheets, and cash flow statements. 
but the way you interpret those and the, the questions you ask based on those um, can lead you know, most people to very different conclusions. And I think of alternative data the same way, that if you're trying to do something relatively simplistic, to just use it in a very straightforward way, there's, um, um, there's not much you'll be able to do there to differentiate yourself. But if you can use it to post questions to, um, uh, or to pose questions, um, or to enrich your understanding in uh, a more nuanced fashion by combining it with other data sets, and, and really using it to dig into deeper questions, I think it's a very fertile area. And I, I just use the income statement as my mm -hmm. analogy. You know, if, if you were trying to, um, um, you know, everyone gets that same data, and we all draw very different conclusions. So the, the more of this alternative data that you can get to um, to supplement that, the more um, the, the more informed you are of the the company. And I, I don't think that that's going away. Right. I will say this this came up in one of the panels yesterday as well, um, where Tony Berkman from Two Sigma was talking about credit card panel data, and how a lot of people think most of the alpha has already been eroded from the usage of that data, but that's only really true of the simple uses. If you think about how you can combine that relatively kind of basic data with other data sources, there's still insight to be had. Um, but at the same time, we're continuously looking for new data sources and, and onboarding new data. So to your question, Ruben, we do a little bit of both. Um, we've tried to develop a relatively strong kind of engineering platform to ingest and test data quickly to see if it's additive, uh, primarily trying to understand if it's in any way orthogonal to the data we're already using. So when you already have a mass corpus of data you're building models off of, um, finding new data sources that are adjacent to that and provide new insight can be, can be quite challenging. Um, and, and doing that with speed requires either a lot of resources or uh, good engineering capabilities and partners. So we also work with some external organizations that help us test data additivity before we onboard it ourselves. Right. Okay. And then for the, you know, turning that question to, to the vendors, how, how do you stay relevant in, and how do you avoid this risk, I suppose, of your data becoming commoditized and less valuable over time? Like what's the, what's the approach there to, to evolve with, with the market as a, as a single vendor? Yeah. So I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think there's really, there's really two ways that I think about this. So on the one hand, you know, it, the, the, the potential for a data set to erode in value is based on how, how rich it is and how high dimensional it is. You know, if you're just looking at pictures of cars in parking lots, like that's one metric. You know, that, that can, the market can get to know that metric and incorporate it into their analyses pretty quickly. But the richer the data, you know, the further you can slice and dice things, the more, the more value you can get. So that's, that's kind of one, one lens. Another, another thing is that in some ways, you know, financial markets are pretty sophisticated and capital is allocated relatively efficiently, but in other ways, in other ways there, there's, a lot, there's a lot left wanting. So, so here's an analogy for you. Imagine you're, you're going to buy a car and you take the car to a mechanic. And imagine the mechanic can only look at the speedometer of the car. Ridiculous, right? I mean, you, you'd, want the, you'd want the mechanic to look under the hood, look at the engine, and really understand the inner workings. But in some way, you know, financial investors have historically been closer to the mechanic who just looks at the speedometer. We look at outcome metrics, um, proxies for performance. You know, like you mentioned, the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, these are all indicators of performance. But in order to really understand a company, you really do need to look under the hood and look at the engine. And the engine of a company, I mean, that's the people, that's the processes, the product. And, you know, we are very new to this. You know, I don't think, I don't think investors have been analyzing people and employment until just a few years ago. But, you know, any CEO will tell you that's the most important thing to understand about their business. So there really is a big gap in how investors understand companies and, and how companies can be understood. So I think, you know, maybe we can get there, but, you know, I, I don't think we're close. I think we're maybe, you know, 20, 100 years away from, from getting to a point where, where companies uh, are really understood 
as deeply as they, they can be. Sir. Right, from our perspective, we're a very product fo focused company and we're in a space where, you know, the, the data sets that people want to use are changing. The questions are changing, the data sets are changing. There are certain data sets that have become commoditized um, and then there's niche areas that, you know, uh, not everyone necessarily is aware of. Um, so we get, we, with our customers, uh, you know, and we have all the largest hedge funds and, you know, a, lo uh, a lot of the biggest research groups and, and investment managers as customers, they'll call us up and say, we need this, and the next day we'll have it live, right? So because we have the product that can handle the CAPTCHAs or handle the, you know, whatever the blocking is or the technical complexity, we can point, click, deploy, and scale. Um, a data collection operation. So our focus is very much on the product, whether we're licensing our software or delivering bespoke um, custom data services. Um, our focus is on speed to market accuracy and compliance.